Uh, looks like we've made it. We looks made like... it. Yeah, this is um. <laughs> so I'm wearing this T-shirt today that says "I am pastureless." Are you? <laughs> and the new, and the new streaming platform that we're using to do this LinkedIn Live, which is why we're 10 minutes late, doesn't support pastureless. And Ryan and I just had to be on a Zoom prior to reset my password for the streaming service. So um, <laughs> if the people at Restream.io are listening to this, please, for the love of God, um, <laughs> add Pastorless to to your to your platform because um, I'm sure we kept a bunch of people waiting. But thank you all for yeah. being patient. Yes, that is, uh, for any, any that is in our, uh, in our, um, viewers or audience who, who did patiently wait, um, we, we definitely thank you for that as well for those who are, uh, maybe, maybe watching us on a YouTube stream, uh, for those who are over there, please like subscribe, tell us if there's anything you'd like to see other than what content we are building or sharing here on a monthly basis. Um, and I will second the advocation of making Restream have password lists on their roadmap, at least move to pass keys or something else. Let's just let's just make this process go forward because that was a that was a flashback, man. We live in this great life, dude. Like, yeah, our hyper bubble is so amazing that <laughs> like when you leave that bubble, it, it's just so brutal. It's just so brutal. Yeah, no passwords in Hyper. But let's get to the topic at hand where uh, we've kept people waiting long enough. We're going to talk about how to make sure that the IT person you just hired is in North Korea. Yes, and uh, I believe we need to have that view updated here on our screen. Waiting for a quick transition. There we okay. go. Perfect. We 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 did you know it, it, we had such great graphics that it's like come on we gotta get this up and showing, uh, but definitely making sure that uh, your IT hire isn't in North Korea is a very timely subject I think uh, with at least the last two weeks. Um, news headlines have obviously been out there. I know uh, you and I have talked about it, Boylan. Yeah, it's a multi-billion-dollar industry right for the North Korean government. Um, it's like. IT outsourcing, crypto, uh, fentanyl. I, I read. I, I listened to some podcasts. I have no idea if this is true or not. But apparently, like North Korea, like per capita, is like one of the biggest like meth usage populations by by um, by population. It's kind of crazy. That, that is a very interesting statistic. If that is true. We yeah. cannot confirm or deny on. Oh, we don't know. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we don't. I've never been. I'd love to go someday. Um, and, uh, and and recently, there's been quite a few news headlines around uh, North Korean folks pretending to be uh, American workers, and you know, well-paid ones, highly skilled ones, and they them particularly getting access to the systems of North American companies. Sometimes they're just doing the work, right? Uh, and other times they're actually working to exfiltrate data and install malware and do more malicious things. But regardless, uh, if you're a US-based company, chances are you can't work with companies on the OFAC list. Uh, and so that means no North Koreans and no Iranians, as well as a few others. So, yeah. Definitely. Um, and it, it's interesting too, because I think we, we had, I had made reference. There was a news article that had popped up in October of last year, specifically on hey, you know, there's there's evidence of some uh, employees being from North Korea within the IT uh, world, and then we officially got an, a statement from the the government saying, hey, be advised, um, this is happening. And then I think what in the last three weeks, that's when we got this flood of information, as well as no before, um, which I have to give a lot of props and respect to for reporting. I mean you and I were talking about it earlier, like this isn't something that is technically defined as a breach. So if you are a public company, you, you still don't even have to report it under the, the section 105 at the 8K filings. Yeah, you know, it's um, that's an interesting dynamic. And, and the Department of Justice report that came out was, you know, specifically talking about North Korea. But the reason that they got involved to begin with is because it is people in North Korea, 
right? But there are people doing this for companies in the United States, in Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, Latin America, right? Anywhere where they can um, make more money. And so there's, it's, it's a pretty prevalent um, narrative these days around the person that is doing the job, you know, that sometimes doesn't turn their camera on and, and all that type of stuff, you know, is probably not the person that you hired. And um, that's becoming a common common scenario, especially now that about 40% of people are working from remote or working remotely permanently. Um, and, and that number is, is growing. Right. And so uh, let's talk about who's who in the zoo for the North Korean uh, incident in particular. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's, I think this is actually kind of really a good topic because you were just kind of bringing it up, right? Like North Korea, we have a lot of public visibility because it was North Korea, but there is a, a whole other pattern of this that has been happening specifically or specifically after the pandemic where we've had so much more remote work come up that um it's not just north korea i think this though is very timely i think this should sh shine some light on how big this issue truly is yeah you know so talk, to talk about like who's involved in this whole thing and and how this uh know before and and some of these other incidents went down there's you know several primary actors one is the person who's least involved in this whole thing which is just some guy or a gal who has gotten their identity stolen that happens to be a United States citizen, right? So hackers will steal their identity, uh, get access to their basic information, social security number, driver's license, da da da, create a fake ID for them, and you know they will uh, they'll essentially sometimes create a LinkedIn profile for that person that's fake. Uh, and they will, you know, pretend to be that person in an interview. Uh, and then that individual, that fake individual, uh, you know, who's had their identity stolen will get a job at a U.S.-based company. And when they say, hey, new employee at this U.S.-based company, do you want to, where should we ship your laptop? Uh, they ship it to the next actor in the chain here, which is a U.S.-based middle person. And and uh, I think in the DOJ investigation that was done, uh, this person was in Nashville, right? And they just had a laptop farm at their residence or wherever they were, or th these li different laptops that were in their house connected to the internet were for different for were for different companies, um, and and they, you know, they're basically just sitting there on all the time, uh, and during the workday. There's somebody from North Korea or China who is essentially uh, uh, rem remoted into that machine using, you know, uh, some remote viewing software or remote management software, uh, and you know, fixing bugs, committing code, you know, <laughs> installing malware, doing what they need to do. Yeah. They, they... That farm, the, the picture of that farm was actually pretty insane because if I remember correctly, they were upside down open laptops on a floor just sprawled. I think they had like seven or eight or, or 12 of them. Um, and it is, it's very interesting too because it is, they're talented IT professionals from North Korea. They, they function and do their jobs, right? Um, the last part of that is probably where and the reason why we have this being reported is because of where that money and funding was going to. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely in North Korea, reaping some financial benefits from that. And uh, as you said earlier, part of part of the non non participating countries that we want to be contributing to. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, they they make a bunch of money off of this, and and they use it to do all sorts of things. Um, and you know the the. The, the people who are doing the IT work are part of the government, right? Just like everything else is, and um, you know they're not they're not probably seeing a measurable life improvement, right? And and the North Korean government is usually working through intermediary banks in China or other countries to funnel the money through, uh, and and ultimately get get the cash out. Uh, so uh, this is a IT impersonization slash fraud slash money laundering scheme uh that is is pretty interesting uh and just super fascinating 
I think it also goes to the the concerns, uh, not necessarily what I say the concerns, like every year we've been doing this in identity and we talk about how there's identity theft, how identities are sitting on the dark web. And, and I, you, I remember even like 10 years ago, like a single identity was like getting down to a dollar, dollar 50 if you wanted it. And that came with credit cards. That came with everything. Like it, it, the volume of identities that are already out there makes this so easy for that start. Right. Um, have you ever been on that subreddit overwork? I sorry, I got a little advantageous and hit that little button there. Um, I have not been on that subreddit uh, of overworked. Yeah, so there's this overworked subreddit, and basically it's just people talking about how they are doing job stacking, right? Working four or five jobs, and one of the interesting ones that I saw recently was this guy who's like a. I think he's like a security guard at a prison or something. So he just sits there all day, has a very boring job watching um, the prisoners on the screens. And so he was talking about how he has two other jobs on his laptop while he's at his physical job <laughs> watching people on screens. And, uh, you know, and, and how they're outsourcing some of those jobs to other people to actually work them. So there's people who are out there, you know, making, you know, uh, I don't know how much a, a prison guard makes, but I assume it's not hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they are making hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it is possible. Um, it is. Yeah. Let's talk about the impact, though. But yeah, I think this one carries. I like in that sense of severity. I think the impact here in this specific <laughs> scenario has a little bit more weight to it, um, based off of the scenario. Uh, Look, the, the loss of productivity, we can always advocate that. I think in this scenario, the intellectual property part could also be of a big, big concern because of the uh, security restrictions and the limitations in which, in essence, the world has tried to put on this country specifically. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's there's the business impact, right? There's, I mean, if you have somebody working for you in North Korea, like you're out of compliance in some way. Right. And probably many ways that you don't even know. <laughs> so so um, that that's a obvious. And obviously, this is a person who has access to your network, to your environment, um, who can do what they need to do to gather intelligence, move laterally, steal credentials, so on and so forth, uh, and do other malicious things. And at the end of the day, for, you know, for North Korea and some other countries who are on the OFAC list, like, uh, you know, it's a non-trivial percentage of the proceeds here goes directly to nuclear uh, weapons development potentially, and and that's something that scares me. Right, living in a very densely populated area in North America, um, it's ter it's a terrifying prospect, and, and so it's something that we have to think about as a nation state also, around how it might impact us in the years and decades to come. Definitely. Uh... I will go with that in the metropolitan area. I'm I'm usually on the closer end when we get to that side. That's <laughs> still has to go a long, long way. But uh, you know, in this specific one, I think this is the route it would take. Um, so so some would argue that California, where you live, is already in such a state of decay <laughs> that you know it's not even worth trying. But you know, let's. <laughs> All right, I'm not gonna bash on California anymore. Sorry to anybody who lives in California. Oh, it's a great, it's a, but it's a great joke, right? That is true. Some some do say these things, and uh, as long as everybody wants to run away, I'll stay. Um, the the other thing you were kind of bringing up, like the compliance, not the compliance side, but the security side, right? Like these are IT workers, and what do we do with our IT workers? We usually inherently trust them to have the skills, even if they're accessing a PAM system and getting credentials. Like in essence, this is an insider threat problem now. So, mm -hmm. like, I remember you and I were sitting back discussing this, and man, the threat modeling and exercises and like all the the hurdles we were just going through, like this this pivots quite a different routes when you have to threat model through on how you prevent and pr protect around this. Yeah, there's a threat model of everybody being in the same office all the time and working, which is like this big. And then there's the threat model that's like giant the moment you let something like this go on. Um, so let's talk about how businesses can, businesses can actually prevent this. I think everybody understands it's a major issue and they're going to need to figure out an answer. Yeah, we definitely, uh, you know, 
not that we had the foresight, but obviously when we work with our enterprises, there was a reason why we started going down the path of what we're calling MVV, MFV today. Um, but putting more verification up front uh, of that identity. So uh, as we put in that first bullet point here on the screen, which is uh, a deeper identity verification check and risk assessments, uh, it needs to actually not just be the one time. Obviously, we need to do, I think, a, a very strong linking in the very, very beginning, right? The, the link of that physical uh, identity to the, the digital identity within the enterprise. But I think there's a secondary part to that because I think we, we'd be like, oh, hey, we did it. We're good. Um, and we would kind of hand off for the rest. I think there is that, that we're at that point now where there has to be uh, reoccurring verification checks happening throughout, whether it's a time base through behavior, through risk. Um, and also if there's any, I think uh, when we talk about like uh, I'm adding a new device or I, for some reason, if you happen to be having to do password resets, I'm not calling you out again, restream, but uh, maybe an identity verification uh, in a password reset context as well. Yeah, it's uh, this is one of those situations where lots of companies have put in tremendous effort in recent years to roll out MFA, multi-factor authentication. But it, in this instance, you have a malicious insider who is purposely sharing a credential with somebody in North Korea, in this example, to access your system. Right. So like, what MFA does, and it's terrific and you have to have it, and we're going to talk about that more, is it verifies the account. It doesn't verify the person. If I've given my account access to someone else, that person is me if you're just doing MFA. So this is where multi-factor verification really has to come into play. And, and now we're going to talk about how the heck it actually works uh, and, and what, we've seen, what we've seen work within organization. And, and so basically, you would want to use multi-factor verification, Ryan, like you said, any time anybody is resetting a credential, meaning they get a new phone, those are or they're being onboarded. Even during the interview process, we're starting to see multi-factor verification being used. Uh, and then obviously, any time that you sense any risk in the environment for a particular account, you want to make sure that it's the right person who needs to have access to that account, right? So. Uh, the, the way that we typically work with companies to do multi-factor verification is we take the user through a configurable set of uh, steps, right? Depending on uh, the level of access they have within an organization or our lack of familiarity with that individual. And that can include verifying their device, uh, their location, obviously. Can't be in North Korea, sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, their document, making sure that they're holding a legal document from a entity that we trust, like the DMV. Um, I don't know how much you trust your DMV or have faith in them, but they make great documents. Um, and then, if required, even a video chat with another human being who knows that person and can vouch for them. Um, and then, you know, doing this process whenever the necessity is there. Um, and then you know, afterwards, they can reset their password, enroll into MFA, get access to the system, so on and so forth. And so we have an example like handy dandy chart that we created of how this might look within an organization, right? Where how can you prevent this fraud using multi-factor authentication and uh, multi-factor verification together? Uh, and, and so this can start even pre-employment during the interview process where, hey, this person that I'm talking to for this interview, um, are they in the right place? Do they have a valid device, phone number? Do they have a valid government document? Uh, and, and, you know, can I actually see them on camera before I, before I interview them? And, and doing all this verification, having this audit trail is really important. Uh, and then you know, bringing in that through the rest of the journey, uh, Ryan. Yeah, then, you know, the importance of, uh, apparently it's perfect timing, my camera decided to freeze. <laughs> We're having all sorts of fun today, right? Um, the, after the, the acceptance through the interview process, right, the, having that one MFA, which we'll say MFA, 
honestly, I don't think there's any better solution than going with a passwordless or pass key type solution because there's a level of assurance that you're going to have with that. And I think that is the bare minimum. Uh, but there is still behavior things that will manifest with users. Um, and having some other behavior and risk signals detected, maybe someone's origins is changing, maybe somebody's work patterns are, ha uh, are, are unfamiliar, you need to re-verify. And it might also be that we can get to the point where this is so efficient and fast that that re-verification doesn't require another human to be involved. It's all automated and it's just another checkpoint once again. We do need to kind of keep ourselves in alignment with NIST. And I think that almost every digital identity within an organization that is not a non-human identity, that's not a, a, a machine identity, should have some level of IAL association to it and have that checked and reevaluated every every time there's an authentication event that takes place. Um, that's opinion. I think the future will be there. <laughs> yep. But um, that, that I think this is... Like this thing, this wave graph showing that, right? We're gonna have these behaviors even throughout the life cycle. A year, two year, three years of of employment, you still want to be re-verifying these individuals. That's right. Yeah, and what we see is, you know, organizations today tend to verify a person's identity only when they first join the company, and that doesn't make any sense when everybody's remote, especially. Right, so um, when people change roles, when they're trying to access a critical system at two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, which, by the way, that they have access to, right? That, that they're qualified to operate, but maybe you just want to make sure that it's them at that time, right? and, and not somebody who has stolen their credential, or, or God forbid, they've you know share their that credential with somebody nefarious so it's about creating these different baseline for the different levels of privilege you know your lower privilege users will have a, a lower threshold of when they need to be re-verified and and higher privilege users will uh, require to to go through this process more i would i would even expand on the initial verification that you're kind of bringing up like onboarding and hiring that verification is usually not even in consideration to an identity or an IAM program, right? It, that's more at the HR level, which is, hey, here's your W-4s, your, you know, here's your, you know, are your legal documents? And then maybe there's a background check. And at what level does that background check truly go through? But at that point, it's kind of that trust system. Like, all right, HR says this is going to be the employee. At no point is there really a verification taking place as the uh, credentials are being issued. Uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, the, I, the employee verification and onboarding process in most companies that I've seen and I talk to has is the same today as it was in 2002. And that makes no sense. Like, you know, Google was a four-year-old company at that time. <laughs> like, And so I think we have to evolve, we have to change, and I think some of these... Uh, some of these types of attacks that really became more popular since remote work became much more popular are, are forcing the are forcing the conversation, which is good. Yep. And I believe now we actually get to do a quick short video so you can actually see what that process would be for a credential to be issued. Um, this is a uh, obviously you're all falling victim to having to watch something I type and I, I uh, record it here. I did do some extra security privacy things along the way, but in essence, what we're doing is supplying something uh, like my email address or an identifier user ID, as well as verifying with a text message, right? So the text message, we'll say it again, it's for spam mitigate, uh, mitigation. Um, it's n not necessarily a, a security posture, but more a uh, just another signal in the evaluation. Uh, we also require you to type that in. So it is almost like a knowledge element, uh, despite all things being um, a shared secret. And uh, then we're also going to do a quick location check uh, of that user, right? And once again, this becomes another signal. And right now, um, we're just getting confirmation. Somebody could say, hey, what if they don't put on the uh, location services? That's fine. There's always a fallback to an IP address as well. Uh, but in this scenario, what we're going to do is we're going to keep this nice and streamlined. It's just going to go through a doc auth uh, and verification of uh, the document and a selfie. I successfully... I uh, had my phone disconnected during the licensing scanning so you don't get to see my ID. 
um, in, in a streamlined way. But in essence, we are going to do an official uh, document and system lookup, right? So the the DMV, as Boyan had brought up, how much you trust the DMV. Uh, there is value in actually being able to validate the information with those systems of record as well, because if somebody is using something like uh, AI or something else to generate a fake ID and, and alter some information on that ID, uh, this can easily be detected when you do and check with the system of record. And as you can see, this is going to go through and we'll complete the update. Uh, hopefully this is still playing through. There we go. Yes, yep. Uh, um, there, there's a lot of value in being able to do that and also getting that to the point of the credential issuance, right? This is being bound. I now will have, uh, in essence, an IAL level two identity associated to this specific authenticator that I'm going to get. Um, and it looks like my screen has slowed on playing, so I'm not seeing the video so well. Let's see if we can jump past that. There we go, phone was broken. All right. Uh, as you can see, Alex and I had a meeting today. Um, <laughs> but in essence, the, the information is then verified and I will simply have uh, a credential issued. Now, I will repeat it uh, again and again. That identity is now bound, right? Like we now have an IAL association to a very high level uh, associated, uh, asserted uh, authenticator. So the good combination there. It also didn't require um, another human in this situation, but as Boyan was saying earlier, having the flexibility to add a verification, maybe my ID had a little suspicious uh, characters to it, and that should just trigger an escalation to a live environment or a live human for additional verifications as well. Um, it does look like we have something that has come up from a LinkedIn, from a Jonathan. Yeah, he asked, how are you balancing constant verification to enterprises while providing a good user experience to employees? Um, so, you know, different businesses will require different verification frequencies. For example, we are super draconian here at Hyper, and we require that everybody goes uh, and re-verifies their entire identity every two weeks. And uh, well, we don't recommend that everybody does that. We just love using our own products. Um, but, you know, for, for enterprises, uh, this, this will be a reasonably infrequent process, right? When people get new devices, when they lose credentials, when they need to resets, things that they would need to pick up the phone for and call somebody, uh, they would go through a re-verification process. Or when we notice some pretty significant risky behavior, right? Like if they all of a sudden installed um, screen sharing software on their computer, you may want to ask them to, you know, re-verify their identity at that point, or if they're coming in from strange locations, so on and so forth. And the nice thing is, this entire process is largely self-service, so people can do it from any browser on any device, um, assuming that they can provide the right signals in the data. So uh, it's pretty easy. And then I, we can even elaborate on that. Like, uh, is it a managed device that they're authenticating from or not? You know, that's pretty common in the enterprises today, whether it's Intune managed or Jamf managed or any of these other uh, machines, if they're attempting to authenticate and all of a sudden now it's from an unmanaged device, that could definitely be a trigger as well. Um, there's a plethora of signals in which could trigger this off, but I think as you were describing, Boyan, the masses within the enterprise usually will not trigger a re-verification other than say a, a functional new device ad or, or password resets. Yep. What will happen a lot in October, which is in a few weeks, is uh, the new iPhone will come out, and a bunch of people, a bunch of corporate employees, will go to the Apple Store or their Verizon Store, wherever they buy their iPhone. They'll buy the new one. They'll trade their old one in. And they'll show up to work on Monday morning, and their MFA app will not be on their new phone. And they'll say, "Geez, I can't log into my work stuff." And many of those people will pick up that phone and call the IT service desk and say, I can't log in, I need my MFA set up. And most of those service desks will say, okay, what's the last four years social and the date that you started or some other easy to figure out question and they will give them a new credential. And that type of situation is ripe for attack uh, and that's what hackers are taking advantage of right now from a social engineering perspective. Definitely. Um, I think we've hit our actual logical closing point, though. Uh, yes, we have. 
which is uh, very strange because usually I like to keep this going longer and longer and longer because it's <laughs> just fun. Um, I will say thank you uh, for those who did stick around. Once again, if you're on YouTube, uh, please like, subscribe. Uh, also, any comments for maybe some topics that uh, Boyan and I can take on uh, that would be fun that we weren't even anticipating. Uh, if not, you're all stuck with the content we're going to build anyways. Um, we have fun doing this either way. And then for those on LinkedIn, we all obviously appreciate you uh, being here in support of this as well. Um, and we apologize once again for uh, having a little late start today. It's all Restream's fault. Thank you all. <laughs> all right. Have a wonderful one, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.